بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد Moving forward to chapter number 35 from Riyad Salihin with a summarized reading and summarized commentary and explanation. The author says, Babu haqq zawji ala al-mar'ah The rights of the husband over his wife. The rights of the husband over his wife. After he mentioned in chapter 34, the advice to treat women kindly. Which goes to show us that Islam is not a religion for picking and choosing. We can't pick and choose what we want. Many people today, they will be in the forefront of proclaiming the status of women in Islam. One of the longest surahs in the Quran is called An-Nisa, chapter 4. Another surah in the Quran is Maryam. And Allah talks about the mother of Musa and the wife of Fir'aun and this righteous woman and so on and so on and so forth. When a woman gets married, she does not change her last name. She keeps her own lineage, quote unquote. A woman inherits. And the list goes on of the rights that women have in Islam that many women don't have today, let alone 1,400 years ago. And they'll accept that, that a woman can have her own money and run a business like Khadija did, radiallahu anha. She hired the prophet. Listen to that now. A woman having her own business, having her own money, is one thing, but now a woman hiring a man and employing him, that's a whole nother level of status and respect. It was unknown 1400 years ago, and they'll accept these things. But if you read to them a verse in the Quran, Arijalun qawamun ala nisa, men are the qawamun, protectors, maintainers, the guardians, the safekeepers of women, they say, no, 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 that doesn't apply. In 2019, things are different. Women work. This is, this is a different world that we have. Uh, the hadith that says a, a woman who believes in Allah on the last day cannot travel out of mahram is different now. There's safety. We have this. We have that. The Quran says, Literal translation, word for word translation, and hit them. They said, no, it doesn't apply anymore. A woman has to ask permission to leave her house. No, 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 it doesn't apply. It's different. Things are different now. It's a modern society we have now. And Islam is flexible. And so many different things that don't apply, or really doesn't mean that, or it's not literal, it's a different explanation, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. So it's a great deal of hypocrisy of the people who call themselves conservative, or progressive, or balanced. Great deal of hypocrisy. They'll take every virtue of a woman, right of a woman, but they won't take the things that are over a woman, that a man has rights over his wife. They won't accept that. The Prophet ﷺ says this about the wife. He's your fire or your paradise. If I told anyone to make sujood to anyone other than Allah, they won't accept those things. That a woman cannot refuse her husband. The, the concept in the college. So you can't say that. There is no such thing that she has to go with him if she wants to. They'll accept that without any shyness and without any type of fear of Allah. Totally bold. Where have you studied the traditional explanation of this hadith? Please tell me. Where? Syria, Medina, where, where did you study? Where did you read the classical shot of this hadith? What it means and what it doesn't mean? Nowhere. But they'll tell you what it doesn't mean. You can't say that. But any come, when it comes to anything for them, they'll accept that huh, quickly. So it's a great deal of hypocrisy that men have and women have. All right? And that's why it's important to read these types of books. That way you get everything. Women have rights for them and they have rights over them, against them. It's not a one-way street. You can't just do what you want to do. Your fancy and your convenience. Islam is for and against us all. We have to do things, and I deserve things from you. You deserve things from me. So this is something which is very, very dangerous. And the people at the bottom line is, they want Islam to be what happened to Christianity and those other religions and ways. That's what they want Islam to be. They want Islam to have no substance, no core, they want Islam to be something which is in the hearts, one day out of the week, holidays, and that's it. They don't want a tangible way of life, a practical way of life. And every chance they get to take a brick or block, that's what they do. Every chance they get to make someone to misrepresent Islam and its practice, that's what they do. So we have to be very careful. So in Islam, there are rights that a man has over his wife. Haq. That was mandated by Allah. 
subhanahu wa ta'ala that was legislated by the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not because of me or you or this person who's a chauvinist or a sexist or a misogynist or anything like this. Allah and His Messenger, they've legislated these things. So if you believe in Allah and His Messenger, and you believe that you have to submit to Allah and His Messenger, then we can move forward in understanding the ayah, understanding the hadith. If you have no faith, no iman, what can we talk about? The concept of submission doesn't exist to you. You submit to money. You submit to your work. You submit to culture. You submit to your practice. You submit to support sports. You submit to your lusts. We can't even have a conversation. You don't even pray. You don't understand the concept of tawheed. What can we talk about? What is there to discuss? You don't know the concept of submitting to your creator. And this is why it's very important when you talk to someone who is a Jew or a Christian or some type of faith or religion, you meet in middle ground. Because they do believe in a God. Then those who believe in one God. Then those who believe that that one God is supposed to be perfect and omnipotent. And you move forward from there. You don't discuss something with someone who has no concept of any creator or God about legislation and submission. They're atheists. They don't believe in anything. You have to deal with them in a different manner. All right? So the concept of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not for us to pick and choose. We submit to Allah in a kind treatment of women. And we also submit to Allah and the responsibilities, duties, and rights that a woman owes to her husband. No, we rahim Allah says, قال الله تعالى الرجال قومون على النساء بما فضل الله بعضهم على بعض وبما أنفقوا من أموالهم فالصالحات قانتات حافظات للغيب بما حفظ الله Allah the Exalted says, chapter 4, verse 34 Men are the protectors, maintainers, the guardians of women because of what Allah has given one sex over the next and because of the wealth that they spend. So therefore, women who are salihat, righteous, qanitat, observant, and these women who keep what they're supposed to keep secret, and they protect what they're supposed to protect, bima hafidhullah, because of Allah protecting them. A righteous woman who's been protected by Allah will protect her husband. A woman who's been protected by Allah will protect her husband's wealth. In his honor, she won't allow anyone to slander her husband. She won't allow anyone to speak ill of her husband. And this is why whenever you go to a place, wherever you are, and there's a woman and she makes a joke about her husband or complains about her husband, even if she's laughing in an apartment store or a restaurant, oh, yeah, my husband, he, he does know for sure that something's wrong. No woman will make a joke about her husband and speak about her husband in front of a total stranger. Except that there's a serious huh, problem in their marriage. Nor would she allow someone to speak ill about her husband. True, false, doesn't matter. That's my husband. It's not your place to say that. I am here to defend him and to stand up for his honor. And the same applies to the husband's wealth and his property. And the list goes on. So this goes to show us here the concept of if a man is a protector and a maintainer, then obviously there's something that that protector and maintainer gets and receives for his protection and his maintenance. For his protection and his maintenance. Protecting, keeping safe, feeding, providing, lodging, doing all of those things for someone, there's supposed to be something in return. And that thing that the husband gets in return is what he deserves of hukuk, of rights. The house over your head is provided by me. The safety in this house is provided by me. The food, the drink, the clothing is provided by me. So it's only sensible and logical for me to deserve hukuk, rights from you. I want to understand this. So this is what's extracted from this ayah. They spend their money. And Allah Azawajal has made one dominant over the other. Allah has made one over the other. One above the other. That's how it is. So therefore, these men, they deserve certain things. So if they protect and they maintain, then they deserve rights as well. Then he says, as far as the hadith, um, then we have the hadith of Amr ibn al-Ahwas in the previous chapter. The next hadith he says, Allah 
فلم تأته فبات قد بان عليها لعنتها الملائكة حتى تصبح متفقا عليه وفي رواية لهما إذا باتت المرأة هجرة فراش زوجها لعنتها الملائكة حتى تصبح وفي رواية قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم والذي نفس بيده ما من رجل يدعو امرأته إلى فراشه فتأب عليه إلا كان الذي في السماء ساخطا عليها حتى يرضى عنها Abu Huraira narrates in hadith number 287 The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said When a man calls his wife to his bed And she refuses to go to his bed And he goes to sleep and he's angry and upset at her The angels send curses upon her until the morning The angels, the malaika They send curses upon her until the morning time And this hadith is collected by Bukhari in Muslim Tayyip uh, in a different subversions, one of them says, I swear by the one whose soul my hand lies, uh, that whoever calls his wife to the bed and she refuses, Allah Azza wa Jal, who's above the heavens, will be angry with her until her husband is pleased with her. Tremendous hadith that many women take for granted, neglect, forget about. And many women don't even know about this hadith. And they'll say, well, it was your fault. It's your fault that I'm angry with you. Or, so what? Or, I have rights too. I'm a woman. I have feelings. I'm not your slave. I'm not your concubine. So on and so forth. And they let the shaitan trick them and fool them. They let the shaitan trick them and fool them because of ego or other reasons. Your husband is angry with you. Bottom line. You want to go to Jannah or you want to go to hellfire? You thinking that hellfire is going to matter who was right or who was wrong in the argument or the fight? It's not going to be of any concern to those angels who are commanded to punish you. It's not going to be of any concern for those angels who curse you in this dunya. So the concept of not allowing your husband to go to sleep angry with you, that's the sign of a righteous woman and a righteous wife. Even if the husband was wrong, she still is going to say, okay, what can I do to make you pleased with me? And what effect would I have upon the man if a woman doesn't want to go to sleep with her husband angry at her, even if he was supposedly wrong? What is that going to do to the man's mind? You understand this? So the concept of a woman being a servant of Allah, Ar-Rahman, and from the service of, of Allah is obedience to the husband and making sure that she's pleased. So this hadith shows us if a woman refuses to be intimate with her husband without no legitimate excuse or reason, then she has fallen to a major sin. She's fallen to a major sin. And from the rights that a man deserves over his wife is to enjoy her when he pleases, as long as there is no legitimate Islamic reason for other than that. Next hadith, وعن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه أيضا أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لا يحل لمرأة أن تسوم وزوجها شاهد إلا بإذنه ولا تأذن في بيته إلا بإذنه متفق عليه وهذا لفظ البخاري أبو هريرة رضي الله عنه narrated it. The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said A woman cannot fast while her husband is present unless he gives her permission as we explained the other day, the voluntary fast. Nor is a woman allowed to allow anyone into his house unless he gives permission. Unless he gives permission. And this hadith is also collected by Al-Bukhari and by Muslim. And the wording belongs to Al-Bukhari. So the concept of whose house is it? Her house or your house? Even if it's her house, hypothetically, you pay the bills. You pay whatever you're paying. Mortgage, whatever you're paying. Halal, haram, al muhim. Who's paying for the house? Who looks after the house? And you tell your wife, do not let this person in my house. Don't let any strangers in my house. Or this cousin or uncle or fulana, do not let them in my house. That's my family, that's my friend. Do not let them in my house. Period. She has to obey. If the husband is unreasonable, if he's being extreme, which many brothers are, and many husbands are, unfortunately, then that's a different story. With regards to talking about it, discussing it, complaining, Whatever is on the bottom will come to the surface eventually. But there's no unreasonable nature or behavior of the husband. And he doesn't want this person in his house. The woman has to obey. So the house, first and foremost, is supposed to be by the husband. It's supposed to be his house. And oftentimes we have unconventional marriages. In which the sister has a house, she says, come live with me. Or she has an apartment, come live with me. You pay half the rent, you pay half the mortgage, you pay half the bills, whatever the case may be. But if you make that agreement... You're now relinquishing certain rights and certain authority. Because someone whose house and pays the bills, you're not going to tell them what to do. 
And that's the first thing that she's going to say. How are you going to tell me what to do in what? My house. You can get out if you don't like it. huh? So it's very dangerous. Moving forward. وعن ابن عمر رضي الله عنهما عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه قال كلكم راع وكلكم مسؤول عن ريته والأمير راع والرجل راع على أهل بيته والمرأة راعية على بيت زوجها وولده فكلكم راع وكلكم مسؤول عن ريته متفق عليه ابن عمر رضي الله عنهما narrates the Prophet ﷺ says each and every one of you is a shepherd and each and every one of you is responsible for his flock the leader the emir is responsible a man is responsible for his household. A woman is responsible inside of the household of her husband and her children. You're all shepherds. And you're all held responsible for your sheep and for your goats. All of you. Your, your flock, your herd, your ra'iyya. You have to look after them. And this hadith is collected by Imam al-Bukhari and by Imam Muslim. And it proves that a man is responsible. And if a man is responsible, and if he's risking him, himself, Spending his money, his time, his efforts, his energy, then he deserves rights. He deserves rights. And she has to give those rights to the man who's looking after her and the man who is responsible for her. The next hadith, وعن أبي طلق أو قال وعن أبي وعن أبي علي طلق بن علي رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إذا دع الرجل زوجته لحاجته فلتأته وإن كانت على التنور رواه الترمذي والنسائي وقال الترمذي حديث حسن صحيح أبو علي طلق بن علي رضي الله عنه narrates the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم saying when a man calls his wife for his need she should go to him even if she's baking something at the clay oven in other words put down what you're doing to go to your husband and it's another very critical mistake that many women they make they'll say oh just a second or let me do this first I'm looking after the kids, or so on and so on and so forth. What message does that send to the husband and send to the children? Child learns and understands. Children come before father. Children comes before the grown-up. And that's backwards. In Islam and outside of Islam. The man planning, organizing, prioritizing. Obviously his wife, she's busy with the house. Of course, you use your brain. You use your brain. And the Muslim always has sabr. But the general concept of making you wait... So let me finish this and do this. That's an issue. And obviously, sometimes a woman has to prioritize as well. Let me take care of this the way I can be free to serve you and give you everything that you need and want from me. So there's always a balance. There's always a balance. But we're not talking about balance. We're talking about people that clearly do that. Everyone understand this? And many people, they, they make this mistake. With regards to someone who has a higher status, they come first. Everyone understand that? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa barak. Ala abdi wa rasulina bina wa imamina Muhammad.